Welcome to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. If you're looking to create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want, you're in the right place. Our goal is to simplify and make real estate investing easy for you. For more information, you can find us at www.jlm.realestate. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, Real Income from Real Estate. This is your host, Jason Lee, and I'm here joined with Douglas Dowell. Doug, thanks for being on the show today. How are you doing? Jason, th thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, to kick off the show, would you mind just telling the audience about you know more about who you are and what you do? Sure. My uh, current uh, current uh, segment of the business that I work in is uh, raising capital for uh, development deals primarily, uh, also helping with due diligence and putting uh, build a rent as our we really like build a rent currently, so we're really passionate about that space. Uh, would love to do some affordable housing to the extent I can do some of that, and I also like multi tenant retail. Um, haven't, bit, haven't found that project yet, but if I can do that ground all also, I would love to play in that space. So those are my, uh, what I'm doing currently. Very cool. And, um, why did you decide again to real estate? Well, um, actually been around the real estate business, uh, all of my career for the most part. I, uh, I don't know if you, uh, came across this guy. There's a, uh, late night infomercial by a guy by the name of Carlton Sheets. And so anyway, Carlton had this late item infomercial and I'm in high school and I'm like, what? No money down real estate. That sounds kind of dodgy to me, but I checked it out and it's like, oh, okay, you can do that. Um, and then coincidentally <laughs> around the same time, uh, a friend of mine had, uh, his dad actually had some rental houses. So doing light turn work, mowing lawns, it was like, oh, you can make a business out of this. So that, that really did alter my, my trajectory. Uh, went off to college, majored in economics, minored in finance. Um, and then, uh, a little period of uh, experience in the banking world and then went to law school after that. So literally it was all with the, I'd like to be around real estate somehow, some way. Um, and so did a lot of W2 work uh, in, in the real estate space uh, was, uh, you know, did a brokerage assistant for Marcus and Millichap, checked out the brokerage space. That wasn't a fit. Didn't really, didn't really uh, catch my fancy. Um Really uh, enjoyed working for uh, Sprint as an office leasing agent, uh, taking you know their retail locations, helping them with that, and then uh, practice bankruptcy law for a period just to say, well, you know, I've been there and done that and practiced law. And uh, again, there it's it's like a, uh, I don't know if I'm Forrest Gump or Goldilocks, one of the two. So going through the different opportunities in real estate or to see what what the just right forage is, if you will, and so. Um, eventually it just became obvious. It's like, I need to be in the entrepreneurial space on, in real estate and, uh, from having that institutional or W2 experience and then putting it all together and, uh, development was always, uh, interesting to me. And in the second year of law school, I read a case about a developer doing, uh, um, multi-tenant retail. And so every since that you read a case and you're like, really, I, I think I want to be on the, 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 the developer side in this, I don't really want to practice law for this guy. So uh, it was interesting and, and inspirational. So really in the heart of hearts, I've always had a, an eye toward being a, a developer, but getting that, uh, that mindset and getting, you know, prepared to be in that space. Cause there's a lot of uh, spinning plates going on on the development side. So that's, that's where I'm at now, finally pushing out into the entrepreneurial side. Cool. Um, development's a very uh, intricate, intricate, challenging space with a lot of, you know, barriers in your way, you know, um, a lot of different material and verbiage that's hard to understand. I mean, how did you uh, learn the business and understand what's going on? Yeah, uh, I will say thank God for Urban Land Institute. First and foremost, the the library that Urban Land Institute offers, you don't, they have programs too, by the way, if you want to actually go and have somebody teach you is great. But uh, to save a little bit of money, uh, if you're a bootstrapping, uh, even the textbooks that they use for the Urban Land Institute is the first place I would point if you're interested in this space. Um, John McNillis uh, also wrote a book, uh, Getting Started in the Development Space. Uh, I can't remember what John's book was. I, I'm sorry it's escaping me, but it was really a great entry-level read. And then the uh, – and they also do – what's great about Urban Land Institute, like say for shopping centers or multi-tenant uh, uh, mixed-use. They have a mixed-use handbook. I've got that. Uh, and then some – I will say their basic – 
development handbooks uh, are a really great start to give you a broad overview. And then, of course, you can venture off into the different books in terms of market analysis um, and also zoning and books that talk about zoning. So it really is, you know, just read read a bunch and you can get most of the way there. But ultimately, my my big belief about the real estate business is the very best way to be an entrepreneur in a real estate business is either be uh, born rich, uh, marry rich, which is two strikes for me. Or the very best way is joint venture with an experienced partner. And that's what my business model is all about. I'm going to partner with experienced operators and experienced people. And my ultimate partners are all construction related because I, I don't know anything literally about construction, like building a building and putting it together. I don't know about the details of that. That's not my my uh, area of expertise, but I, I really can help in terms of uh, the financing, the equity raise, and and doing the basically all the back office stuff, and get the deal teed up, and then let the construction partner really hammer the project home. Very cool. Um, so you you're the capital raiser, you're the equity debt guy. Um, what are you seeing in the capital markets right now? Um, interesting. It, it it's a very uh, there's a lot of uncertainty with folks in terms of, okay, where are rates going? Where do we think this is going to be? And then again, this is the big, uh, for existing projects, especially um, you want to, I'm a big believer and big proponent of fixed rate debt right now. Um, it's a good way to lock in your, uh, your rate risk. Um, bridge debt is to me really tricky. People doing naked bridge debt right now is really kind of a little more uh, interesting than I think I'd want to, I'd want to take on. But uh, those are my big things right now. It's just uh, maybe institutional capital uh, like uh, Fannie Freddie, if you can. Uh, those are good bets right now. And then, of course, the other side of the coin is, too, is just raising extra, extra equity for more cushion right now to help, help adjust for things. It is my belief and thesis that if you raise enough equity and you have enough cushion, the market will eventually in a 10 year period, almost correct, almost all mistakes. Um, and I, I, I'm a big believer in that. So just build yourself enough cushion to have some leeway. If you get your pro forma a little bit off, um, give you, give yourself some leeway. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't feel too good being a syndicator who overpaid for a, a deal that was turnkey and got bridge debt on it, short-term debt. I'm afraid right now there's a couple of folks more than more than a handful probably that bought bridge debt at maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago. They're probably not having a great time right now is my, <laughs> my speculation. Yeah. Where, where do you see the interest rates going? Like how, how high do you see them going? Um, I know it's a you know very tough question to answer, but just want to hear your opinion on it. Well, just based on what my read is, is that the, we can count on a, a, this raise and then maybe one more the rest of the year. Um, and then from there, it's going to be interesting. I kind of feel like we're seeing softness in the the transit numbers. We're seeing softness already in the transit. We're seeing the supply chain start to correct itself. Um, I believe they actually might start cutting some sometime next year um, with the amount of softness we're seeing in some of the data. Um, so what exact number we get to, I'm not real comfortable with and saying I'm pegging it at that number. But my my just my gut feeling and gut read is that we'll probably max out toward the end of the year and then it'll start to start to tail off interesting yeah okay um and then on the equity side um you're saying that you know it, it's better to protect yourself by raising more equity um for someone who doesn't understand how rates affect your deal and, and values could you just explain how exactly and why that all ties in together yeah sure the, there there is a relationship of the debt to the amount of returns ultimately. So what your what your trade off is by raising more equity, you're saying okay, in exchange for uh, more equity, I'm driving down my cash on cash uh, returns. I'm I'm basically saying I'm sacrificing some kind of risk over here for a more cushion over here. So the more debt you take on, you get a much higher cash on cash return. Um, but the flip side is you're actually bearing more risk. So what I, I feel like, you know, uh, and, and then the reality is the, the banks are responding to the marketplace by cutting back on their LTVs. So essentially by raising more equity cushion anyway, and they're kind of forcing you to in a way, or I will say there is some seller financing, which is kind of unique to me. I never thought I'd see the day that seller financing came back into the picture, but I, I understand there are some folks being creative with some seller financing 
uh, here and there. So that's kind of, I didn't expect to see that on my bingo card, seller financing being back in the conversation. But, and as I understand it too, also um, a lot of sellers are still being hesitant to adjust to the new reality too. So that's also another interesting thing going in the market. Yeah, I know. Seller carry is very uh, rare, but um, surprisingly, I'm doing a seller carry deal right now. Um, for someone who doesn't understand what seller financing is, would you mind explaining it real quick? Sure. Uh, seller financing is essentially, essentially is just a second mortgage that the uh, the seller is willing to say, well, I'll hold a mortgage for that portion of the equity stack in, in lieu. So that lieu reduces the amount of equity you have to bring to the table. Um, it does require the generally almost every case. I don't know where there's, this wouldn't be the case, but the bank, the bank that's the ultimate uh, lender that's going to be in first position does need to approve of that. But I think again, that it's so common in the history of real estate and commercial, especially that sellers aren't unheard of. Seller carries not unheard of. And as long as it's not the entire stack, for example, um, they probably would be, ha you know, uh, amenable to that to help reduce the the total total carry. Their their exposure is kind of taken into account. So, if second, sure, you go ahead if you feel like you want to do that. Yeah, great explanation. Uh, where do you see the market going in the next, you know, two to three years? Um, it really is an interesting question because a part of me is like, well, we could see some real pain from. Um, with things calming down in terms of uh, asset prices and whatnot, we could see some significant drops uh, in the real estate, in the single family homes, for example. We're seeing some significant pricing uh, adjustments. I'm not a big believer of that, though, necessarily. I, I'm a believer in, okay, 2008, you had a ton of developers get crushed. And so 2010, okay, we start to burn off all the foreclosure inventory. We keep moving along 2012, 2013, and eventually, you know, maybe what, 20, 2014, 2015 or so, it feels like we kind of started getting closer to a normal market. And then as a consequence of the, so many developers being crushed, um, we, we started getting behind, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, demographics, uh, millennials actually continuing to progress in life and starting to have families. Um, so... Then we have household formation being uh, pent up. And so what you've got is a real problem of we're just really far behind in housing stock. And um, the numbers can be really shocking. So there may be some finance financially driven corrections in the marketplace. But anybody tells me, well, we're going to have this complete market crash. I just don't believe it. Um, and so there might be some pricing adjustments and there might be some significant ones. But housing crash uh, i think that's just overselling it too much i agree it you know 2022 is a totally different time than 2008 um a lot more people that are looking for homes looking yeah. for apartment units there's a lot of demand and not enough units out there um on top of that there's a lot of good debt out there i mean a lot of people yep. refied at you know three to four percent interest rates so that's right um, people have equity too so Different market. Yep, and not only that, you've still got the FHA program sitting out there for the people that have been on the sidelines all this time waiting for the prices to adjust. The FHA is going to be right there for a nice three percent down. They come in and buy that buy their home that they want. So um, I just don't feel like there's there's so much pent up demand. I just don't see any big story of a big market cra crash because there's so much pent up demand. The the two facts are just inconsistent with each other to me. Yeah. Um. Why did you choose uh, to go into into the uh, build to rent development space. That's uh, mainly driven from the same demographic story that we just talked about. I just feel like there's such a uh, such a drastic uh, hole in the marketplace right there. And I feel like, um, you know, I, I like apartments, I like other asset classes, but in terms of, okay, well, where do I allocate my time the most? Well, A, I love development. B, I believe in the shortage of housing. It's a serious problem. And uh, even affordable housing is eventually part of what, what I'd like to work on. Um, and all of those issues are, are serious at play. So if I can get in and, and help that particular part of the marketplace, I feel like I'm, that's where I'm most suited to be, uh, be of help, be of service really. Got it. Um, and for people who are looking to invest in real estate, any, you know, any tips you, you have for them? Yeah, um, if, if you're going in as an LP, uh, limited partner, that's a great opportunity. There's a great book by Brian Burke out there about this. It's the Hands-Off Real Estate Investor. So if you haven't done any investing in an in, in, in LP position, 
um, from a syndication standpoint, always recommend Brian's, Brian's book. Um, uh, also take a look at your sponsors, get to know them. And, that, and I think that's the, the tough part about, uh, uh, apartment syndication and getting to know, uh, the sponsors is, is a challenge because it, 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 by nature is very opaque. You just don't, well, you don't meet a, a, an apartment syndicator, uh, at your local, local grocery store on average. So, Getting to know and, and networking is a big one. Um, just network uh, to the extent you can. Um, really, and then if you want to be a hands-on investor, you know, it's not bad to start off with uh, FHA 3% down programs. Uh, the fourplex loan, if you really are committed to learning about real estate investing and your spouse is amenable, um, that's the, that's the uh, hidden caveat to the FHA program is your spouse has to be on board. But having said that, the very best way to get started, and I wish I had thought about this way back when, uh, the FHA 3% down FHA fourplex loan is an incredible place to start if you want to be a more hands-on investor. So depending on what you're looking for, um, there's just different different avenues. I agree. Um, and how has real estate investing changed your life so far? Um. You know, I'm really excited about to find out what that really looks like. I, you know, coming from a W-2 background and then actually going off into the the entrepreneurial space, it really feels like it's the right the right home for me. I, I, again, career-wise, it just never fit that never never quite fit into the cubicle, if you will. And so, it, like, it, it's like you might be an entrepreneur if you can't stand the cubicle, then there's a good chance you should look at being an entrepreneur because you get get such a ver variety of different challenges on a daily basis, which is much more suitable uh, for folks with that, with that desire. And so just also it's about mindset. Um, just, just the satisfaction of being a part of a solution is, is a, is a huge, huge, huge thing and very fulfilling. Um, and I look forward to uh, fully getting onto that side of things. Yeah, no, amazing advice, Doug. Um Final question for you. If the audience wants to go learn about more about uh, who you are and what you do, how can they do so? Uh, LinkedIn is the very best way to get a hold of me. I'm also on Twitter, but not as much these days. Uh, but LinkedIn, very much the very best place to find me for sure. Awesome. And that's just your first and last name? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Well, I'll put that link in the show notes. But other than that, um, thanks for coming on, Douglas. It was a great, uh, great time interviewing you. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on.